questions. So um, I hope you're not hangry. No. <laughs> no? Okay. <laughs> All I right. don't get hangry, inshallah. Uh, no, alhamdulillah. No, no. What's, the, what's the last book that you are reading? I think it's called Ordinary Virtue. I'm, I was trying to remember um, because I know you're, I, I, you asked me that last time. And um, I've been actually, I've been down a, a couple of different rabbit holes of reading. So I'm preparing some classes for next fall and I've been reading all sorts of different books about spiritual formation, both from the Christian tradition and from ours. And then I've also, I'm really interested right now. Oh, I know the book that I read very recently by Howard Gardner. It's called Truth. What's it called? Truth something. It's Truth in the title. It was a good book, even though I can't remember the title. And then I, the other one, I think it's called Ordinary Virtue, but I might be mistaken. And it's about um, virtue. Like it's a whole study around virtue in the Western world. And how do we define virtue? And how do we think about virtue? I like to think about stuff like that. So these are the kinds of things I like to read. Okay. Uh, is there anyone that you would love to have iftar with this month? That I would love to have iftar with? Oh, I'd love to have iftar with my my teachers in Damascus, my friends. Yeah. May Allah make that a reality. When I say a funny Ramadan story, what's the first thing that comes to Dr. Tamra's mind? <laughs> um, a funny Ramadan story? <laughs> Feel free to be Minnesotan in your response. <laughs> well, uh, I mean, a funny Ramadan story. I, I, when I first became Muslim and I, I would go to these dinners and I would be so confused because there were, I, I was so confused by Ramadan in those first early years because we were fasting and I understood we were fasting. And then I would go to this food, all of this food everywhere, so much food. I'd be so confused by the juxtapositioning of those two things. But um, I remember one time, I mean, I don't know, maybe this isn't funny, but looking back on it, I guess I'm embarrassed. So I, I decided it's funny. I, somebody gave me soup and I like soup. I'm a soup person. Minnesotans love soup. And so I started eating the soup and it had all sorts of things in it that I don't eat. I mean, Allah forgive me. It's just because I didn't grow up on a farm, but you know, all those inner parts of animals. And I did not know what to do with this soup. It's not really a funny story. I don't know. I don't, I can't think of funny Ramadan stories. I have to, I have to work on my funny. What's Ramadan? I have, I have a Lebanese background. So we eat all sorts of body parts of, of the animals. So I can, I can yeah. relate. Um, any tips? I mean, you've raised a family, mashallah. Uh, any tips for waking up a family for suhoor? Smells. So what I used to do for my very, <laughs> oh, the very first suhoor of Ramadan, we always had homemade cinnamon rolls because I, I do, I baked, but I wasn't like a prolific baker. I had other things I was doing most of my life. But that first morning we had homemade cinnamon rolls and there is nothing like a cinnamon roll baking in the oven with fre like fresh homemade cinnamon rolls in the oven to get people climbing out of their beds and coming to the kitchen asking, what's that? What's that? What's in the oven? So really so that's, I mean, that's bake at like three in the morning. You'd be baking. Oh yeah. I mean, though, if anyone knows how to, about cinnamon rolls, like you have to start those early because you have to, it's a yeasted dough. So I would start at the night. I mean, it was a planned thing. I'm a planner. But yeah, three in the morning for sure. That's when you, when you put them in and then they come out, they're hot and the kids are all getting up. Everyone's getting up for that because it smells so good. So anytime there's good smells going on, it's usually an easier way to get people up. That's awesome. First of all. Um, <laughs> you, uh, you worked on the translation of the Sira book by Sheikh Samira Zayed. Um, What's your favorite memory from that experience? Oh. I think my favorite memory from that experience when we had, it was a very long process. It took nine years and we worked with her. Like she was alive at the time. So we worked with her and we would go to her with questions about Arabic and, you know, you're saying this, but what does it exactly mean? And how conversations about what it means but the there was one time where before it was really ready we printed out a 
because it's sometimes called an ARC, an advanced reader copy. That ended up uh, needing a lot of editing, but there was this advanced reader copy and I brought it to her and she was already ill, um, but she was so happy about it. And I kept telling her, it's not ready yet. Like we still need to do a lot of editing. It's not gonna come out tomorrow. This is just the step one. Anyone who's done publishing knows that every step is painful and long. But her joy in knowing that this book was going to be in English was palpable. And that's my happiest memory, that just seeing the joy that it brought her in her life to to know that it was coming out. Jazakallah. And one final question. Um, if you had unlimited resources to put together the ultimate resource for Muslims, what would it be? Actually, I might change this question. Um, you spoke earlier about the grant that you didn't get for the sleep study. If there was a grant on the table, what would you use it for? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a two-part answer. So I really would like to do a sleep study for a, around Tehaju. Like I would like to hire people who know how to do sleep studies. Obviously, I don't, I'm not a scientist, but I would like to hire people who know how to do that and study the effect of Tehajud on practicing Muslims. Because if you think about sleep studies and this, what they tell us about how long we need to sleep, they've never been done on Muslims. They've never been done on people who are doing worship. And so I'd like to set up a study that really looks at what is the impact of Tehajud on the physical need for sleep? How does it benefit us physically? And how, what is that relationship with, between sleep and prayer and all of that kind of stuff? I would love to do that. I would be very excited about writing up something like that and connecting it to early stories of companions and, uh, you know, Sahaba and Tabi'een and all the people who were really serious Tehajjud prayers and just looking at their lives and the success in their lives that might be linked to those nightly prayers. But a big real, that would be a, that grant is like 50, 60,000, maybe 70. But a really, really big, like if you want to, if you're talking in the millions, I get to, it's a dream question, right? I think, I've been thinking a lot about this. Um, what do we need? Like, what do Muslims need in a hundred years? What does my granddaughter need? What do her granddaughters need? Mostly I'm thinking about Muslim women and what Muslim women need in the future. That's kind of the way I spend my day. But I think, and, and I've been looking at, um, education and the world of education and what's happening in different parts of the world and how are people what's happening in the academic world what's happening in different universities in the United States that are popping up here and there or expanding here and there and if I had if someone just called me up and anyone who's listening to this who would like to do this you are more than welcome and wanted to donate three to five million dollars to Rabata I would do a university I would do a real university journal, accreditation, um, undergraduate degrees, graduate degrees, and I would graduate Muslim women around the world in not only Islamically scholarly topics to be local female scholars with secular topics as well, give them the opportunity to be strong. You know, research tells us that women who go to all women's universities, they become leaders. And yeah, I would love to. I would love that opportunity to give that kind of education. I think. I think that the signs are here. If we look at what some of the evangelicals are doing in the United States, and what different religious groups are doing around uh, adult education and university style education, the signs are here that we need to be paying attention as Muslims. We can't always be chasing after everybody. We got to get out there and do the thing first. We have to pay attention that university life is changing. And the digital community is important. And what people are going to need 50 years from now is different than what they need today. And they're going, the kinds of things they're going to need, we as Muslims have to learn how to provide these things. And so that would be my big dream. Uh, Inshallah, it's great. made a reality. I mean, thank you. I mean, um, Dr. Tamra, it's always a pleasure having you on Double Take. Thank you so much. And uh, I hope you have a fruitful Ramadan. I mean, and you as well, everyone who's listening, inshallah.